That's better at the second attempt. Apologies to you, Rory, there. Um, I'm um, going live with this video for, for people today on this episode of the Scholar Gypsies. Today's guest is um, Rory Bryan, and you can see in the bottom of the screen there, it's Rory dash Brian lowercase. And that's uh, there's a significance to that, and Rory's going to get into that in, in just a minute. Um, the subject matter today is based around the Irish Constitution, the 1937 Irish Constitution, and there are a number of people interested in this area. And Rory comes here today as a member of Unbunrath, as you can see the sign behind his head there. Um, and it's a telegram group I came across maybe a month ago, and it caught my attention, and the people in it caught my attention. So um, Rory's kindly agreed to come on today to explain what on the, the Unbunra group are about, but also to give us a flavour of the Irish Constitution and um, some of the work and areas that they're um, involved with. Um, Rory uh, gave a presentation uh, a few weeks ago and I was fascinated what the subject matter was. And one of the things he came up with, um, one of the things he mentioned there is that this difference, a difference, you know, between an Irish national and an Irish citizen. And I know there is a personal story to um, Rory's um, um, interest in this. And we want, I want to get into that uh, as part of my fir uh, first question, too. Um, so... Rory, welcome and thank you very much for doing this interview with me. And apologies because this is the second <laughs> attempt at the start. But um, the, uh, the, you know, broadly speaking, if you could give me a bit of background about yourself, because I know there's a personal story with your mother here and um, from the pandemic, I think, but you can clarify that yourself. And the other thing, I suppose, is. I was very taken with the concept of, you know, the difference between an Irish citizen and an Irish national. And I suppose maybe if we start there and, you know, go in whatever direction you, you see fit. OK. No problem. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Thanks for having me on. You know, it's uh, it's great that you're here and great that we have this chat, which you have some sort of an understanding of what what I'm talking about, which is which is good, because that's the difficult thing in, in at the moment. So I suppose, yeah, there is a personal story behind where I got to here. If you want me to run through that first, then we can jump on yeah, to how, how I became to, yeah. You know, I suppose for me, the lifestyle I lived was always known there was a system that you either had to, could be part of or not in relation to working and taxing and paying commerce and, and doing all those things. And I suppose I learned that from an early age where I sort of grew up in a housing estate where there was a lot of traveller community there in caravans and I befriended a lot of them because of, I left school early and they showed me a little way of I suppose living as a sovereign as such you know and, and having that freedom to either contract or not so later on in life then when I purchased my first home I, I, I you know I was running as I suppose an entrepreneur you know and always Spending for myself and my family, never relying on state or anybody else for anything. And it was when I purchased my first home in about 2005, and that was from Irish Nationwide Building Society. And I was in there, that's where I saved my money. What I believed was my money, and, you know, we done a deal for a mortgage. And I, I fairly understood what it was about, believe it or not. I knew it was all paper contracts, and it was all, you know, it wasn't real. It was just signing promissory notes or whatever and it was later on then when the financial crash came and um, I was contacted by Anglo-Irish Bank and you know I was always as a child even you know when I was mitching off school or whatever I remember getting stopped by the guards at about 11 and being asked my name and I wouldn't give them my name so it was always that way known that I was separate from whenever I wanted a contract or not but I lead you on up to the bank and crisis in about 2008, when Anglo Irish Bank, um, Irish Nationwide were the first building society to go in, go into a crash or such. They closed down, and that's where I had still some of my money saved, and that's where I had my mortgage agreement. And Anglo came on and wrote to me and phoned me, and I wrote them back a few simple questions, you know, identify yourself, show me contracts, all that sort of stuff. That led me on for I was in litigation with those, um, for. 
about 13 years. But when the, so I learned a lot through that whole process. I met a lot of people around Ireland, some very good people, you know. I, I met Bing Gilroy 13 years ago and Neil Armstrong and Lay Litigation and the people from the Bob, all those people. And we helped a lot of people in the banking system. But it, it gave me a greater understanding of money and how money works and, the, you know, the Federal Reserve Bank and the system and the whole fraud and the whole thing. And I was always, you know, sharing stuff about it. So along came COVID, um, you know, nearly three years ago now. I was out in Spain with a few friends on a holiday and we seen this emotion coming up, we would say, on the screen and TV. We were out in the pub or whatever and we got chatting about it. And I said, look, if that's what they're saying it is, we're not going to be able to go home. That was my initial thought of it. And uh, that's because I believed if there was something, why would you let people move from country to country? And we did. We flew home. And then I remember then the, the whole thing, the shenanigans with the with the Cheltenham and the Italians playing football here and all that shenanigans. And then there was a big advertisement that Leo was coming on to do this announcement. So I purposely went to watch Kelly to watch that. and. I was just laughing at what, what I was seeing on the telly because I don't watch TV much. And when I do, I laugh at it, you know, because it's to me, it's so much fiction. It's unbelievable, you know, as a child growing up or a kid, when I start socialising as a teenager, people talking about movies and stuff, I wouldn't even know what they'd be talking about, do you know what I mean? So anyway, um, in 2020, November 2020, my mother was taken into hospital. Um, she had been ill for about four years, you know, she wasn't very mobile and stuff like that. She was, you know, she was very stiff and she had always swollen legs and, you know, emphysema, all these sort of issues with her. Unhealthy, you know, but a beautiful, lovely woman. Um, and it was in, I suppose, November, end of October that year, she took bad and the farm, the paramedics who called out the first night said to my brother and sister, I wasn't even aware this was going on, that if that was my mother, I wouldn't bring her to hospital. Um, she doesn't look like she has COVID and that's where she'd be admitted. So she had a doctor's appointment the next morning and she went to her GP, whatever. They gave her antibiotics for her legs and her chest. So she took ill again that night, but she was only after having a flu vaccine the week before as well. So she, she took ill again and the next group of paramedics came, brought her into hospital and she was admitted into a COVID ward like most people were at the time, I suppose. So it was from there then, me being me, back to the asking the question, you know, on what's going on. And I started ringing the hospital, writing to them. And some of the answers that I was getting was like, reminded me of the first answer I got from AIB Bank back in 2008 or nine. Like, do you know what I mean? Just bullshit, you know, total bullshit and potent protocols and stuff. So, that went on for a few weeks. They had her on the ventilator and all that sort of stuff. And it was on Friday, the 13th of November, 2020, we were called into the hospital. They said my mother no longer had COVID. And she was still alive at this stage and they wanted to meet the family. So we went into the hospital and we sat with the surgeon, I think it was, and his understudy. And, you know, I just asked a couple of simple questions like, you know, what were illnesses? What treatments did you give her? You know, when he started, the way he was answering me was very strange, you know, and he wanted to know why I was asking these questions. And I said, well, my father died at the age of 52. We have some special needs and mental illness in our family. So I'd like to know, you know, what's wrong with my, what's wrong with my mother? You know, is it a registry? What's going on? So then I asked him a simple question, and it was because of my suspicious mind. I said, what will you be putting down as cause of death? And he said, COVID. I said, okay, well, she doesn't have COVID now. She's not dead, blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, I treated her for COVID. So at that stage, I requested an autopsy. And he said to me that I wouldn't ha I'd have to apply to the senior coroner in Dublin for that. And this was on a Friday evening, so I'd have to wait till Monday. So he said, okay, we'll do that. So, of course, it wasn't the most uh, friendly atmosphere at that stage. So we went in and the family made the decision to turn off the machines and we all spent the time around my mother. There was no doctors or nurses or anything in the room, just myself, my family. And, you know, I, I turned into, I suppose, priest come doctor, come everything on the night and we just done a lovely ceremony ourselves and wished her goodbye and stayed with her. 
So I went home that night on the Friday and I got this idea to sleep on my mother's bed because she had moved out of the old family home down to a bungalow in, in near where we lived. And I'd never actually even been in her room. So I went home that night, slept in her room. And I got up the next morning and I felt this damp cold feeling, you know, where I'd been, I just noticed then there was been a slight leak from the back of where she lived and there was a bit of mold and stuff. So it was, you know, it was a weird and she'd actually been living in that. So about nine o'clock that morning, I got a phone call from an understudy from the state coroner on a Saturday who wasn't available until Monday. And she wanted to know, did I want an autopsy and why I wanted an autopsy? And I asked her how she knew this and she said the hospital were on to me so I started getting really suspicious at this stage you can only imagine so I formally emailed the hospital then request or the state coroner sort of say requesting the autopsy and that was about one o'clock that afternoon on the Saturday and then I got an email reply about an hour later with a printed signature from the state coroner um, denying the autopsy that the hospital had told her my mother had died from COVID-19 and due to legislation, they don't, they're don't. not allowed to do autopsy. Something to those words, Jerry. Mm-hmm. So you can only imagine uh, me going through, me being me all these years of looking at corruption and then seeing it at this level in a hospital and watching this stuff going on. And, um, so at that, that was on a Saturday and I got in touch with uh, Rowan Grand Trino that evening through a friend of mine, Paul, who's unfortunately gone away uh, recently, and I wish him well, a great patriot of ours. And unfortunately, the state of found him. But anyway, um, Rowan then that evening got me in touch with Dolores Cal. Okay. I spoke to the, the, the famous Dolores Cal on the phone on the Saturday evening, the 14th of November. And she agreed to meet me in her house. She was going off to Germany. She would cancel a flight. And she told me, this is what she's been waiting for. This is the biggest story. You know, here's a man is demanding an autopsy from the state, you know, that sort of stuff. So we did myself and my partner went out and met her in her house on the Monday. And we, she was getting on to, I suppose, her colleagues or friends or whatever she was calling them from the World Freedom Alliance and all this sort of stuff. And the calls were coming and going. And it was, you know, there was another guy there, Howard, and he, we, he was there and he, was a, he knew a bit about law and I knew a little bit as well. So we, we sort of were hooking our minds together. But a funny thing happened while I was sitting in her sitting room. Her, Dolores' phone rang and my phone rang at the exact same time. And it was the senior state coroner ringing Dolores and it was the coroner from St. Vincent's Hospital ringing me at the exact same time. I didn't know this, and, but it just it was a coincidence. So I said to your man, look, I'm busy at the moment. Ring me back in 10 minutes because he wouldn't give me his number. So I listened to the conversation with Dolores and the state coroner on the phone and it was again very weird and um, it went to a stage where Dolores said do I need to ring the guards here do you know because she was questioning what was Dolores doing getting involved and blah 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 mm-hmm. so then I rang back or he rang me back the guy from Vincent's hospital and we were waiting for the call Howard looked him up so he wasn't only this coroner and uh, pathologist from Vincent's hospital should I say he was also the vice president of the Irish Health Council so he was questioning me as to why I wanted an autopsy and I was questioning him as to why he wouldn't do it. And he mm-hmm. again quoted this legislation. So we looked up the legislation and that was written in about a year before they announced COVID. It was signed in by Simon Harris at the time and it was signed in by most health ministers that if there was any um, deaths due to COVID-19, there was no autopsy because of the, you know, virus or a deadly disease or whatever they were calling it. So what we did then, I suppose, it got hectic at the time. You can only imagine my mother's deceased body is in the hospital. So we wrote to the hospital and we, we told them that, that we didn't want them to touch the body. We wanted the autopsy. We weren't happy. And they wrote back and said they will and they protect the body and stuff like that. And then we start demanding that the hospital or the coroner would do it. We reported to the guards um, here in Bray and it was led, brought to Donnybrook, but they refused to acknowledged that there was any sort of misbehaviour or anything criminal at the time, you know, which was understandable, I suppose. 
So at that stage, then it was going on for days, Jerry. You know, there was Zoom calls coming in from pathologists and doctors from around the world. There was good interest from Portugal. There was a great man called Rodrigo Rodriguez from Portugal. He sort of administrated it all. And the Lords was on. There was guys from Germany, Argentina, and there was a lovely woman called Elizabeth English from Sweden. She got interested in it. Um, so we put we were putting a call out for someone to come to Ireland to do an independent autopsy. So it was only when I suppose we we bring it into constitution because I always knew a little bit about constitution and I knew there was something you know and I I was at the blue book as everyone calls the constitution mm-hmm. now and if you look up Irish constitution you'll see a picture of the blue book but that didn't come out until at least nineteen forty two. And then on to 48, it's not actually the 1937 constitution at all. It's an amended incorporated version of it. But it was only when we wrote to the hospital and we used the constitution and in particular article 41 and the family that the hospital handed over the remains and the care of my mother's body to me and the family. And then we pushed them for them to do the autopsy or to allow us have the hospital and the facilities. So it was after about nine days, we held a memorial service here in Bray and I'd done a bit of a speech on RIP. I mentioned constitution and I mentioned law and rights and our ancestors and my mother's father who gave service in the in the War of Independence. And it was after that then the hospital wrote to us and agreed that they would not do the autopsy, but would give us the facilities of the hospital and the hospital to perform an independent autopsy. At that stage, we didn't even have a pathologist so we were getting anxious at the time. Obviously, we only had a certain amount of time. But um, it was about the ninth day we got contact from two guys from Argentina and another man called Professor Klaus Puskel. He was German. He was a pathologist who worked, I suppose, for the state in Germany. He was uh, doing criminal investigation more so, you know, deaths and all that sort of stuff. But he had done some COVID autopsies, so he agreed to come over. Bizarre, you can imagine at this stage the family and everything that's going on. And just want to ask you a question the there, yeah. Rory. Was yeah. the was the cost of that going to be provided by yourselves or the state? By me. So you would have had to pay. They were giving you the facilities, but yes. you had to pay for it. Well, no, I didn't have to pay for the facilities or the hospital. Well, I had to pay for just for the pathologist. That. Yeah, it's that's all. The state had given us use of what I would call our facilities. You know, so they agreed to do that with no cost. The only cost was that I would pay the man or the woman who was going to come and perform the autopsy for us. So he came over anyway, yeah, big monster of a professor who was retired at the time, but still lecturing in colleges and stuff over there. And I say he was forensic, would be the word, pathologist. That he, that's what that was, his long term job. And I met him in the airport, picked him up, went to a hotel. But I got a phone call on the night before I met him from Dolores and specifically to tell me not to mention vaccines to him. And that was one of the things that I wanted to question because my mother had a flu vaccine, you know, and and stuff like that. So I didn't get a chance to do that. But we spoke and he questioned what I was about and what I wanted to see. And um, he he explained that he had done autopsies on so-called COVID deaths. And everything he looked at, he's seen a really shrunken lung. And, you know, he didn't see, he didn't obviously know what diseases were, but he was just explaining the components of the body that he, what he'd physically seen. And it was the same in most of them, you know. And I suppose being on a ventilator for so long, which would do that to our, our farmer's lung, which we discovered my mother died of. And so, yeah, it was great to meet, you know, it was amazing for me, you know, as I call myself, just a simple, ordinary man. A gentleman who lived a modest life, who just found it for himself and believed in me rights to meeting some, you know, very high intelligent, intellectually trained and qualified people. And and seeing people that off the live iron or the mainstream media directly talking the opposite of what they were selling to the people. And it gave me great insight into I suppose what was going on. So, yeah, I picked him up the next day and I'm from the hotel and brought him to the hospital and it was about half seven in the morning and they were waiting outside. At that stage, I'd been contacted from the directors of the hospital looking for a meeting with me and stuff and I refused it till after the autopsy. 
but when I got there, they wouldn't let me in. They just would let him in on his own. It was very suspicious, you know, and refused me even entry into the mortuary department where it was going to be performed, even though I was paying for it. So, look, it was a bit of a standoff at that stage, and I didn't want to ruin what was going to happen, so I just agreed to let him go in on his own. But me being me, I wasn't happy, and I went back around to the reception, eventually got myself into the building, but I wasn't allowed into into where it was being performed. And he was telling me that in Germany, you can stand and watch through windows yeah. people performing autopsies, you know. So I was all up for it, you know. I was in that mindset. I was that suspicious of what was going on because the the particular doctors and the people running at the state, they were so, you know, and now I'm not saying the, the nurses and the, the general staff. It was when I hit the director level and senior level, the attitude of these people, you know, a bold you know, they believed they were above me, but I didn't allow that. So a very strange thing happened at first during the autopsy where I was sitting there in a the room. The professor, Klaus Bussell, came out to me and said, the hospital have a request. And I said, OK, what's their request? You know, they didn't want it to do it. And now they have a request. So they wanted, while he was doing the autopsy, without getting all into it, they had to remove all the organs, taking samples of every organ, including the brain because I wanted a full autopsy. So they said, he, when he removes the brain, take the samples, they want to preserve and keep the brain. So I thought that was a strange thing as well, requests, you know, and I was like, what the fuck? So you can imagine the weirdness of this. So I refused and I said, look, obviously there's something connection between vaccines and brain. This is what I, I was thinking, you know. And you talk about Alzheimer's. Can just, yeah. Can I just interrupt? Uh, just Please for a do. Any time, come in, yeah. Because you this brought up two, you know, no, you brought up two things there, and I just want to make sure that I don't forget to ask you them. You mentioned that Dolores Cahill said mentioned said not to ask about uh, a vaccine. I assume this when your mother died, it was pre the vac, it was pre the COVID vaccines. But is I, I take it that she meant that not to bring up about that flu vaccine that your mother had taken before she got ill. Is that, cor is that correct? That's, yeah, that, that was the one. That was the one because, you know, when we were talking, I suppose it was all about the damage vaccines can do. And, you know, you know, I, I'm not one for taking pharmaceutical medicines myself. I try not to. I can't remember the last time I actually did. Um, you know, I, I live on, you know, juicing and yeah. stuff for a few years. And I, I, I never really take antibiotics around. So, yeah, it was all about the vaccine for me. And that was strange at the time. And I asked her why, of course. And her answer was that we didn't want him to be suspicious that this is what we were looking for, that if he did a, a straightforward autopsy, we could ask the vaccine questions afterwards. That was our excuse for it. You know, we didn't want him to think we were his mad conspiracy theorists, you know, because he was sceptical as to why we wanted it in the first place. So there was a certain logic to that line of thinking, I suppose. Well, and it was, or, uh, well, I put it to you this way. It was before we didn't know anything about, we didn't know then anything that we know now about the COVID vaccines, because this was just pre, just pre the COVID vaccines. Is that? Yeah, yeah. It was, a flu, it was a flu vaccine at the time. It was pre, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Um, and she was talking about vaccines and she was telling people that this is what's going to happen and she was predicting all this, obviously. But look, that was her excuse and I just got on with it at the time. So, yeah, that, that answers the question. What's the other question, Jerry? The other one to... was the, 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 the one on the pathologist. Um, um, the question I was going to ask is, did you feel there was any in, interference? Did the, you know, the senior people... Um, that were in the, the hospital and prov providing the facility, did they try and influence him in any way or did you feel that he was, um, you know, an honest broker when when in your dealings with him? <clears throat> yeah, it was certainly, it was certainly a change of attitude with him when we met, when I got there, I suppose I was being portrayed by them as the crazy son. Mm -hmm. of something, you know, and they have the script here, the script, you know, and he was like, you know, these people are supposed to read scripts and this is what we do. And he was like, okay, you've done everything you're supposed to do. I don't understand. And he de definitely changed. And yes, I suppose you could see they were very concerned of what was going on and worried and needed to win him over and done that in a, in a, in a room without me being there. 
you could see them inside, you know, and, and that sort of stuff. So, yeah, it, there was a bit of that. And did you have a bit of, did you have your own one to one conversation with him pre him getting in? Were you prepared, were you able to prepare him? Um, in advance, or did he just arrive and you kind of collect? Yeah, him no, I sat with him in the hotel room um, for about three hours, or the hotel lobby, should I say, uh, for three hours the evening that I collected him from the airport. And we, you know, it was, it was great talking to him and understanding. And, you know, some of the stuff he was telling me about, you know, bodies and health and stuff we were having, like just sitting having a great conversation. You know, he was questioning what it is. And I, look, we didn't, nobody knew what COVID was. They were just, you know, they were getting a diagnosis and they were saying, right, that's COVID, you know, and he was saying, well, they say it's COVID, it's COVID, but I can only tell you what damage is done. So we wanted to say, right, well, then we get a sequence of the COVID to match the, the body that was the game afterwards, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, answer the question, Jerry. yeah, they, they, they definitely were, it was, it was weird. It wasn't just imagining, I could see it and I could see them trying to get him away from me type of thing it was weird. That was weird. And then the request for that, but it got more even weird afterwards than what they did because when he was finished, he came in and he, he he sat down and he gave me his report and he had all his writings, you know, and what he'd seen, what he'd done, what he'd taken out, what he, you know, what he observed and what he'd found. And then what was very important is what samples he had taken and how they were be, to be preserved in certain formulas at room temperature and the bloods on ice and all that sort of stuff. And they were to be kept by the hospital at that stage until transport was arranged and the hospital came up with a lovely offer of saying that they would transport the samples so three samples were being sent to London in care of Dolores Cow. three samples of each organ and a sample of you know it was three of everything taken one sample sent to London one to Sweden and the other one to Germany to his lab so it was only days after that that happened that I got an email and we were on a group at this stage and it was a group chat from all the different people that were involved. Um, Elizabeth Inglis from Sweden came in and said, what happened? The samples? Who interfered with the samples? So I came on and said, what's going on? So all the samples were removed from the formula to be kept on room temperature, taken out and put on frozen ice. So that was strange, and then you know I wrote well, back. Who did that? What at what part? Of, who did you get to the bottom of? Who did that, or who was responsible? The hospital, for the hospital had done that. Yeah, the hospital had done that. Would you consider that kind of almost a sabotage thing? Like that can't oh, be. Yeah, an yeah, that an absolute be sabotage. Yeah, yeah, definitely because it was an independent autopsy. They had no right to interfere with any part of it. Mm -hmm. They asked to be part of the transportation of it then. After. They asked to be asked to transportation, but his notes clearly stated as to what how to they do. were to be preserved and all what to do. And they went against his professional opinion and judgment. Um, so it really it caused an awful problem because, I mean, they would take months to tie out to get them back to a position that we wanted to get them to. What we were looking for then was to get a sample of the virus, as they called it, to mm -hmm. match it to the, to the sample. But if the sample was destroyed, it was going to be hard. So, look, Elizabeth Ungles spent a lot of time and effort trying to do it, um, and she eventually did. But at that stage, we had wrote to, I think, up to 30 countries around the world looking for a sample of COVID. Too. We, we, we gave us time to do that, I suppose, mm -hmm. if we got the samples right. But all of them, bar none, came back and said they didn't have the actual virus isolated in the lab, which was strange. <laughs> so, so this, yeah, sorry, were you, a, were, were, you a, were, were you suspicious before this, or did this inability to get a sample of the COVID virus? Um, was that what kicked you off, or had you been? Well, yeah, look, I was so in it that I, I was watching then, you know, and it was a big thing in Ireland and around the people saying Does that, the virus doesn't exist, it's not isolated in a lab, and you could see it going on, and people saying, uh, whatever, that's crazy, but I mean, to have, you know, how can you match someone has a sample? 
but if the road had led me down into the whole what was going on and the results of it was more worrying than, than that yeah but it, I was very suspicious absolutely suspicious yeah it was it was crazy you know no one had the sample so it led us into a road of when we went back then how did they determine COVID so we started interacting with the HSC here and St Vincent's Hospital again saying okay you've obviously determined COVID-19 here so you can imagine every time I asked them a question, they were quoting protocol to me. So when I went under, I said, I'll use the free, under the Freedom of Information Act to ask these, this question. Show me the protocol that you used to determine COVID-19. And the hospital wrote back to say they didn't understand the question. And the HSC, surprisingly, came out with the excuse of the cyber attack. Wow. System that the information no longer exists. That's rubbish anyway. anyway. Yeah, that was rubbish. So look, that that was the way it went. Uh, you know, Professor Klaus Buskell went very strange. Stopped answering emails, stopped replying to me. Elizabeth English, English said she's getting a lot of pressure from media, you know, and I suppose I was, I was then becoming, chasing these people. Dolores Cattle disappeared into whatever the next big thing was for her. And I was left, I suppose, chasing these people down and stuff. But for me, I was going through a whole phase of fire mode. And I had to get back to my own wellness and mindset and stuff to to, to take this on because it was getting weird, you know. The guards were getting funny. Uh, people were getting the friends, family, you know. It was, it was getting full on. It was causing a bit of... So I sort of took a bit of a step back at it from it. But then I was going around meeting some wonderful people. You know, it, it led me to a journey of meeting some amazing people. Jerry really did, you know, from all around Ireland and internationally. So it, it was only after then when I was putting all that pressure on the state and then the mortgage team came up again. And Shoreline Residential had done some business to uh, get onto the mortgage. My, my back to then, George Nationwide. I closed down Anglo, took all their dirt in. That went into Anglo, went into liquidation, and I went into the government created a company called IBRC. Um, and I was I put in a commercial lien against Mike Ainsley, the CEO of there. They were claiming monies off me. I was claiming, so I was doing all that. And that was kept out of court for many years. And then Shoreline Residential bought it. Bought it. Then I went to Pepper. And that was all happening then after this in the last year. And this led me to constitution and believe in constitution and, and, and the work that I've been doing and the amazing people that I met. And everything that I looked at, you know, and be, one of the big things that I found in all of this before we get into constitution is it was a thing that a guard said to me outside of court. When, and it's actually on video. So when we were taking the flag down. I don't know if you've seen that. We were taking the European flag down after the court, having a bit of whatever a moment. And the guard turned around and he said, you know, there's different versions of history, you know, and, and there is, there's so many different versions of history because people it's don't know. When, it must be weird when the guard says that to you. It's kind of even a bit yeah. more sinister. <laughs> so go Can I just ask you, just before yeah, you on, move there, because anything. I want to ask you on your, how did your, what, how did, um, what cause of death did they come up with for your mother then? On after the at the at the uh, na natural natural causes. causes. So natural causes. from your point of view, what they, you were they, right because they were trying to associate that with co the, the 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 thing that triggered you was that they wanted to put COVID nineteen down on her um, death certificate or cause of death, yeah, yeah. and and that anyway. At a base level, you proved that that wasn't what she died of. Yeah, I mean, she hadn't even she wasn't dead when she had COVID. She, I mean, she she hadn't yeah. got COVID. They don't, yeah, she didn't have COVID. She might have had COVID. I don't know what COVID is. To me, it's just a parasite of some sort or whatever. Well, what that led me down just before we do move on, if I, if I will say, because I met at the time when the autopsy was going on. You know, I found out the whole sequence behind it, and looking back at the you know, the agenda, the 21 and the stuff. And they introduced a thing called the Liverpool Pathway back for COVID. So what they were doing, in the, what they'd done to my mother, 
and what they were doing. So I met other people like that were trying to fight the system and found out about me and their parents had died in nursing homes, so settings as they call them. What the what the protocol was that when like if they let's say they went into a nursing home and they got these people in there and they call them settings, they would test let's say there's twenty old people in that nursing home on a Tuesday morning at whatever time. They would send all those samples off to a lab and a computer sequence would match positive or negative. So the majority of them were coming back obviously positive. But the protocol they were using was to remove them off all their previous medication, including fluids. So you could have been on like my mother or something for heart or someone else for whatever illness for 10 years, whatever time that was being removed from them. And then they were obviously dying in what they call clusters of deaths. And they were calling them COVID deaths. And all this was going on at the time. And I was looking at all this and, and researching well, it. Meet so just let me start you there because you've said something there and I can't fathom. Are you saying that the, the COVID protocol involved your mother being taken off of all medications that she might have been on non-COVID? Oh yeah, um, that's the pro- that was the protocol. Yeah, the protocol was any medication that your your mother would need to live. Uh, you know that that was helping her to live, um, or you know anybody's mother, not just yours, but she was she was deprived of that medication for the for a duration of when she alleged allegedly had COVID. Yeah, it was a twenty. I think it was a twenty one day, um, time frame. You know take them off everything, give them whatever, paracetamol, and I think it was the drug, it was a rat, I can't think of the name of it that they were using for COVID at the time in nursing homes. I cannot in believe the, that. In the I've hospital, the ventilator was the hospital way of doing it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you was can imagine... You? This stage, nothing was shocking me, you know. It's <laughs> This stage, I, I was just in a zone of... It's shocking now, looking at it. You know, it, it was facilitating people to die. That's what I'm saying. That's, for an agenda. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying... Let's... Okay, let's let's not attribute um, motivation for a second. No. But let's just say, if you put a thousand old people and take them off their medications while they have COVID as a part of a protocol, the chances of you having an elevated deaths must significantly go up. Yes, you'd think, wouldn't you? Well, especially fluids, you know. That was the big thing. The, honest you know, we, I, spoke, I spoke during to a, to a beautiful woman and her father had died and she spoke to a super, superintendent and he got interested in it because of the fact that they had removed fluids from her father as part of the protocol. You know, and I wouldn't live very long without fluid, never mind my... 82 year old mother, do you know what I mean, or whatever it may be. So, yeah, that was shocking. That was shocking. But that was the protocol, and that was being, what was being ignored. And all this is protocol, you know, all of it. And they're all I in this system. Yeah, and yeah, no, it, I'm not, yeah, my sympathy is with you because I thought I consider myself half knowledgeable about everything that's gone on, and I've never knew that about what you've just described there. So, it's horrific to. To me, yeah. that sounds yeah. like almost assisted dying in a sense, because especially with elderly people um, mm-hmm. and medications like that, I, I just you know, I, I, yeah. it's a shock to me to hear that. Well, but the anyway, big, so, big thing as well was the un, un, untested people, like the before even people were tested positive with COVID. If you were going in with an illness into hospital, if you were up a certain age, they were admitted into COVID wards and stuff. But we we move on from it because that's the facts yeah. of what happened. People yeah. want to accept it or not. We don't want to, you know, it is what it is. Well, how are we going to get out of this? Mm-hmm. You know, for me, it was forgiveness. Um, forgive the fact that I have to let it go in one sense. I will eventually, hopefully, with a couple of others, I probably need about six other people to help me take on a case of that capacity. But hopefully that will happen soon enough. But it's finding, you know, what happened. And it was it was... When my mother passed um, and we had that memorial service and I looked for stuff from her past to see how can I, you know, give her a good sending off or how can I 
talk about her life or who she was or who I am or who are we and all of this. And I was finding my grandfather's War of Independence medal and then researching and looking back, how did we get to this point? You know, everybody's looking where we're going and that's no harm because there's plenty of it to look at. You know, it's crazy out there. Crazy agendas, you know. And But if you look back and really look back at how did we get incorporated from 1916 proclamation to proclaim we're going to have a nation to a declaration of independence, having a war of independence. So we declared it like some countries are. And then eventually we got it. And we got it in 1937 through many, many years of war and, and stuff. And it was given to us. And how we lost it again a couple of years later, 1942. And my mother's death brought me to here. You know, and brought me to meet many people. So it's not a sad story, Jerry. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's not any more to me. It's made me be a, a man of understanding of who I am and, and where where we are from. So we'll move on to nation and citizenship. You know, because before before you do, I just have to comment on yeah. something. Is that please do you, take your time? And, yeah. Your lack of bitter, I, your lack of bitterness, and your forgiveness. I just it's um it's really appealing to see it like in terms of that the way you've processed it and um, personally speaking the way it comes across um and I, I honest to god i didn't know any of that before we um, got on to chat here but i just i think it bears to comment that i think the way you're just in your demeanor the way you're dealing with it is probably um it should be applauded because um again um uh, it's just something I wanted to say, but it's brought to you. It's brought you to this place where you've you you've you've taken this interest in nation, state, constitution, maybe nation, constitution, and it sounds maybe a good point then to jump in to just I suppose to jump into to to some of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, it is because looking back at what happened where we came from and who we are you know who we are and, and that forgiveness is who I am because I have to do that and I'm not doing that for the benefit of anybody that was involved I'm doing that for my own benefit you know and I change my lifestyle for my benefit I do everything for my benefit and you know I don't drink too much anymore I gave it up for many years I don't you know don't do wrong I don't do anything and I, I forgive you know and I do a lot of you know I like plants and stuff and I, I, I do a lot of holistic work and that helps me. So I forgive people for, for me and I, and I get out of that fighter mode into Florida mode. But national capacity was something I discovered using constitution in that, you know, live dead entity into back into family, into, you know, Dorothy Kathleen rather than Dorothy Adamson or whatever it was that you get indoctrinated into. And I met some great people, you know, in particular a man called Rolf, and uh, he was a constitution expert. And Mark Anthony Mouse and stuff like that, that believed in constitution. I could see what I could see. And another man, Dara, in Enniscorty, who understands nation against state, you know, were born into a nation. And the islands, it's 32 counties, sovereign independent states. And it's called ERA, and it still exists. And it exists because of the proclamation and the declaration and the constitution. And that's a fact, you know, and we've all the proof and evidence, you know, we have a court system that is set up in two jurisdictions. We have the government of Ireland and we have ERA, the sovereign uh, our courts, but nobody knows about them. And the difference of being an Irish national you're the nation, you have indivisible, inalienable rights, and you're above state, and you're what they call, the state is like a trust. So if you're a beneficiary as a national to a trust, and when you get incorporated through your birth certificate, you're a trustee, mm -hmm. and you have to follow rules and regulations and stuff like that. So, you know, you see, you see people talk about taking back your birth, life, born, you know, correcting your status, and, you know, you have to, 
two very important documents. One is the Constitution, and I'll read something out about the Constitution because I have a copy of something here. It's Irish Constitution, and it has the full 63 article, Clo Gaelic version, and it has a citizen's manual, and it's all the writings, and it has how Sinn Fein, the original Sinn Fein, which were the group of people, IRB, Irish volunteers, and whatever else that were fighting for our independence, that went into the first stall. That's what they called themselves, Sinn Fein. That's where the name came from. It's not the same political party that we have today. So all the writings and 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 the stuff that came out of that. But the importance of a constitution, I suppose, I'm going to read this just to change the the thought, right? And it's a citizen's manual, and it's a simple guide through the constitution. And what is the meaning of a constitution, and what is its purpose? The free enactment of a constitution is the highest assertion of sovereign by a nation. A constitution is the instrument of government and the fundamental law of a state. And it has this state written in capital S and the state era is written constitutionally as such and I'll get into that later. All other laws depend upon the constitution and any law repugnant to the constitution will be declared null and void by the courts. And we get into that as well. A constitution should therefore be as permanent as the nation can make it, should be secured against facal amendment, okay, which is wrong amendment or, or wrongdoing, or against the purpose of the constitution. No amendment should be done. <laughs> the principal functions of a constitution are to determine by what authorities, legislative, executive, and judicial, the future of the state shall be governed and to define the powers of each of those authorities and their relations to one another. ERA has adopted a noble constitution. Conspicuous in its perplexed and unbalanced world of our day, its proclamation of the basic principles of Christian polity in their name, what are the found foundations of their government, what exercises power, on their behalf, and how their laws are passed. These pages are offered as a guide to citizens who want to know, without spending time legal, legally study, the subject in accordance presents the easiest possible form of questions. So there's a citizen's manual in the Constitution, and I looked that up and stuff. So what I found, Jerry, was when the Constitution came into the full force of law, which was on 29th of December, 1937, Mm -hmm. It was done against the free state. You know, it was anti-treaty. The famous de Valera, who people for some reason are against, you know, and you see the state and every institution and all the all the political parties and anything to do with the, the establishment put this man down for why, I don't know, if you look at actually what he did. You know, and the only excuse they have is that he sent Michael Collins off to England to sign the treaty. Did he or did he not? Or did he stay at home as a president of an island to protect it? As you'd like to think that was his reason and his excuse. But the big thing, what it did was the constitution that was given. It took away our oath to the monarch that de Valera and the pro-treaty, they were ex Sinn Féin and so was, so, was, so was Eamon de Valera. But the oath to the free state and the Anglo-Irish Treaty that became the Free State Constitution of 1922 was to the King and its heirs. And that, there was never a time in Irish history prior to that that there was no monarch. So the oath was always to a monarch through our laws that they've been embodied into us since Brehan Law and took away. So in 1936, when the anti-treaty people after the Civil War which got hammered. But De Valera got, I suppose, money from America and he set up the Irish newspaper group and he got himself behind, got people behind him. And people understood then, I suppose, the Irish national people, presidents and Catholics, because I've both on both sides of my family. You know, my grandfather was married to a very prominent president and he was ex-IRA, you know, but he believed in freedom and the nation and it was never about religion. So 
it was in 1936 when the king advocated the throne and Eamon de Valera ceased the moment as he should have done and did and started to get the constitution in full force which, and removing the oaths to the monarch. And then that was put to an election in July 1937 by state nationwide state plebiscite. Now people will say that Northern Ireland didn't vote um, and they didn't, but Ulster did. So it was a nationwide state plebiscite and it was brought into the full force of law in 19, the 29th of December 1937. And it was 63 article Clo Gaelic text constitution, which dates back. That's the key here, the writings and the grammar and the text that's in the constitution. And it removed that free state um, crown incorporated version of ourselves that we were given. And in the original 22 constitution, they created two dominions. One was called Ireland, all caps, and the other one was called Northern Ireland. And we came fully incorporated into the crown. And he wanted to remove that, I suppose, rule for Irish men and women. And Article 1 is the nation. And I'll read Article 1 out to you because it's very important. The nation hereby affirms its inalienable, indefeasible and sovereign right to in its own form of government, sorry, my ears going to determine its relations with other nations and to develop life politically, economic and cultural in accordance with its own genius and traditions. So the Irish constitution came into the full force of law in 1937. So do you want to ask me any questions before I move on with that? Well, I suppose the the there is one question that I have and it's, it's one with to do with the I hear a lot of people talking about the Irish the the Irish language version of the um, 1937 Constitution and the English language uh, um, version that there is something the claim is made I think that there is something lost in the translation or you know words to that effect. I'm just wondering, have you have you come across this this thinking or the kind of people that talk about that? Yeah, all the time, all the time. Um, I mean, anybody that's looked at constitutions, most of the people I've met are looking at the 50 article, blue book, as it's formerly mm -hmm. known. You know, look at the colour of it alone. It should be ringing alarm bells. I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah. This is actually the original, I don't know if you can see it, that's the colour. Mm -hmm. There's the draft that was voted on mm -hmm. um, under state plebiscite. It's, you know, it's sovereign goldy colour, you know, the books are green. Um, yeah, so the English interpretation of the constitution, even written in the original um, 1937, you have the Clo Gaelic 63 articles and you have an English interpretation next to them. Mm -hmm. And even in that interpretation into English, it removes a lot of your rights. And do you want to go through some of those some of those intricacies of what those rights might be? Yeah, it does. Well, it it, it removes it, what it does is it takes the first thing it did. It not the big massive thing that it done. It removed you being from an Irish national into an incorporated version. So they took out Article Fifty One to 63 consecutively omitted those articles from the next publication of a constitution and he done that under the terms of emergency wartime measures so the very first amendment to this constitution is what we believe is the fraud and they changed the definition of war to amend the constitution and then the next publication of a constitution that's what they allowed them the omissions were doing but yet the, the Irish Clo Gaelic still held the full force of law. So when they printed the incorporated version, they wrote it only in English and in Roman Irish. They changed their language. But in pursuant to Article 8 of the Clo Gaelic version of the Constitution, for any law or acts or anything to be brought into law or can be used in one language on their own, either it be Clo Gaelic or English, because Clo Gaelic is our national first principle text, and Os Gaelic is a language, and English is only second official language. But to use one language on its own, 
it's only for business purposes. So that they used, this is my understanding and research has shown me, they used then, we were going into the new reset of the federal bank now, coming into the 40s. They used the wartime measures and they printed the next constitution to incorporate us all from our birth certificate into this new system as an all caps name. So none of the laws that you try and use in the original constitution can stand to you in that persona of, of yourself. So anyone that wants to look at constitution needs to look at the 63 article Clo Gaelic constitution. So we have... So okay. the, the big thing, just to say, the big thing, I suppose, is where to use common good um, you know, the, instead of the benefit of the people, they use, uh, again, in the, in the family, they use common good instead of the welfare of the people. They take away the people out of the constitution and, and bring in persons and corporation. And that's a massive thing that they've done, I suppose, Jerry. And that's why when I fight in courts, I bring myself back to that Irish national capacity. And that's your identification on the first page of your passport. Does that answer mm -hmm. your question? Uh, yeah, it does. I suppose that I, I, I just want to clarify the dates around. So it seems to me from listening to you there is we had the 1937 version, vote for um, um, constitution. Then on the next pu publication of the document, there seems to be quite a bit either in the translation or the, or the English publication of that document is from, if I'm following you correctly, contained omissions or there were omissions um, from it. Is that is that yeah. correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. They omitted Article 51 to 63. And what date were we talking there, um, Rory? That would have happened. What happened, the Constitution came into the full force of law and ERA was recognised as a sovereign, independent state, a nation on that day around you know around the world it was you know that's when we stopped being searched on a hair and then we became era our coinage changed everything changed our constitution but it only lasted for you can imagine 29th of december so it lasted for a couple of days 1937 into 1938 and for about eight months of 1939 and then we went into world war Two. germany invaded poland mm -hmm. a bit like what's happening now constitutional change reset currencies coming up you know they were going into the federal reserve bank now and the world was being reincorporated again so that's when they made the first amendment of the constitution they changed the um, meaning of war to say if there's a war it could be a war and you know the other side of the planet and we can use that to so that was the so what they did they printed the six the 52 articles in a pale blue book and they changed the whole, you know, we became, the, the whole Irish Republic was removed from it. Pro Gaelic was removed. Irish law, none of it is in it. The whole Irish version of the Constitution was completely removed, except for Article 1 and 2 and 3, which was the nation. But the rest from there on, the state era became the government of Ireland. You know, it became it reincorporated back into the free state again, and we became a dominion again, I suppose, of the UK for commerce purposes. I suppose that's why they've done it. But what can I say that, as somebody who's an absolute novice here? So, apologies yeah. if the questions are a bit simple, but uh, the text of that original constitution is still our constitution. You're talking about a publication issue, really, in terms of they've, it's like publishing a book with three chapters missing out of it. The original book is still the original book, if you know what I mean. Oh, yeah. Is that, is, and is that still, a yeah, absolutely. It's still the original book and it's still enrolled in the offices of your Supreme Court in Clo Gaelic okay. as the rule of law, as the rule of law on the mm -hmm. land. As an Irish national, this is your... The Constitution is not for me. The, I'm an Irish national. The Constitution then, Article 1, 2 and 3, is the nation. 
and um, then you have the, the the name of the state, which is era, and then the rest is rules of government and and stuff the way the society should run. Mm-hmm. So it's the enrolled text, which is our. If you listen to this again, it's an, it's our national first principle official text is called Gaelic. Mm-hmm. So prior to 1937, 1980 and 16, and even in 80 and 18, back then what they were removing from us Irish nationals was our language and our text. And that's how they were able to take over era, formerly Ireland or whatever you want to call it, Eru, era. Ireland is just the incorporated version. Republic of Ireland, they're just dominions of the UK. And that's why all their scripts and text and grammar, you know, and we'll move on to the court case a little bit if you want, and I'll explain how we, we fought the bank in the court and how we tried to use the constitution and how it benefited us. So you talk about the text and grammar and characteristics of the writings. You're a writer. So if I'm writing a law to you, if you're Chinese, let's say, and I don't write it in Chinese, you'll never be able to, you know, it's not. So these laws were written for us in Clo Gaelic. So for them to change a law or make an amendment or put an act on us, they must enroll that in Clo Gaelic in the offices of the Irish Supreme Court. And we've looked back to 1984, none of them have been. So that's why they, they really fight against me trying to use my Christ name, my national capacity, and try and incorporate me in, in, into my all caps and they've done that recently. They arrested me in an airport when I was picking up my son. He was spending a few months in Mexico and took me into custody um, about a couple of months ago, Jerry. You know, because I'm traveling around with, you know, private capacity, you know, my own, don't have registered plates, just totally, you know, separate myself from, from the system. And they weren't obviously able to do anything while I was out in, in public. I'm not that public. I, I'm a people. You know, the word public is, a, is an arena. And I was traveling around there, but I went into the airport and I suppose it's a portal, it's a different, you know, and they arrested me and what they said, I had a speeding warrant for my arrest and stuff and held me in custody, and brought me to the CCJ in, in Dublin and spent the whole day there. But they wouldn't let me in front of a judge and then I eventually got in front of a judge and, you know, I was claiming my national capacity and they were, they had brought up a photograph, a copy of the, citizenship side of my passport which is the picture the first page is your national identity the second page is your citizenship and you use that to go do commerce you know that's your citizenship that's your company so i was arguing my point and they just they took up this picture and i said where did you get that from they taken it out of my property unknownst to me and the judge said give the man his property but it was missing from the court so he, he agreed to let me sign as my own national name the way I sign or Rory Bryant you know beneficiary or whatever trust family of Adamson but then uh, the guards stood up and had an argument that they wanted to bond me back to that name so the judge rested out and then they changed judges I was left outside it went to five o'clock six o'clock in the evening and then a new judge came in and they came back out they wouldn't even let me back in and said the judge is not letting you sign so they sent me to Clover Hill while I was in there the fair play to the sergeant who, who was there. One they, they, just a question. There was this, there was it seems to me that there was there's a there was gonna be an issue if you signed as your um Rory Bryan and they needed to stop you doing it. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah because the, they were trying to bond you. they were trying to bond you to your own they're trying to bond you on your we'll say Rory Adamson name is that is it, yes is, is that that's right yeah, yeah 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 so because what I discovered in and if you look you know and I, I've gone on to the internal revenue in in America you know and where the where everything is held in trust and you know the, the treasury over there and stuff and it's all that's where it's all logged I've got stuff sent back and evidence of that so what I had what I had done in my understanding right I've separated me as the man to this corporation that was set up through my birth certificate. And on most people's birth certificate, there's an, what they call an informant who signs that over. And usually it's their parents. In my case, it was a nun called Sister Agnes something from St. Colin McGill's Hospital who signed me over to the state as 
created and that's how the corporations are set up and that's how we're incorporated. So I'd separate myself completely. I'd done that in the court case in Wexford and I got acknowledged as such, you know, and and, and the judge was calling me Rory Bryan. I was accepted as a national. My constitution was recognised as the sovereign seal that was inside the court. The judge recognised that. And she also admitted that the rules of Roman civil procedure do not apply to I, Rory Bryan, the living man, which was massive. And we asked that question, you know, Mark Mouse, and we worked, we worked with a guy called Christopher James, and obviously Mark's interview with him, and that's where we got these questions from. And the rules of Roman civil procedure is the writings on the documents. So I completely separated myself from the licensee, the citizenship to the national, you know, and... I start living in that capacity. But they were trying to bond me back into that. Yeah. So I went into Clover Hill and fair play to the guy in there. He said, Why are you in here? You know, I said, I don't know. I'm just after being basically kidnapped and dragged out of my automobile and my sitting outside my beautiful son and his girlfriend and kept in Ballymongarda station. And now I'm here. So he said, But you will sign. I said, Yeah, I'll sign. You get me a blue pen and I'll sign. This is the way it went, seriously. I was put into the holding cell and he called me out and he goes, do you know, if you want to sign and I don't let you sign, I he, I could charge him €5,000 a night. That's what he said to me. <laughs> so I said, great. So it's, so it's obvious that the, the, the state apparatus, we'll say, let's put it that way, the court system and the guard, the, the guard of Shia Khanna, are aware of this of what you're talking about there's an aware either you brought it up either you bringing it up um triggered something or triggered a response but they're they're obviously nobody's going what the hell are you talking about yeah you know kind of thing. yeah yeah so there must be a kind of undercurrent where and the way the court dealt with you um there must yeah. be an undercurrent that they understand that there must be some communication behind the scenes on this. What, what's your opinion on that? Side yeah, I, I, de I definitely agree because I've spoke obviously to many guards in the last, especially year, because I got but through the banking thing, I got involved with a with a scam. I well, was through a barrister that I was working with, um, and uh, with with litigation to do a deal with with a company called Caris for Assets. I don't know if you've seen that, and people lost money. I was one of those victims. Mm -hmm. and that's gone to the National Crime Bureau. But I had written an 84-page document into the court as a conditional acceptance. So I corrected who I was, all my identification, and I showed the whole fraud of the banking system, what I had found over 13 years of corruption. That led me to link Carisford Assets to Pepper Finance in meetings dealings and showed the whole scam of what happened. They showed all the letters I've been writing over the years and I delivered that to the court and the judge took it up to read it and tried to turn it over and to play that trick where it's blank at the bottom and we had it all stamped and stuff and it was proof, it was massive proof of the whole banking fraud that was going on but it was also acknowledging and I called for a constitutional court of record and brought the law in so she, she held it in her hand, the document, and she looked at it and she just said to the their barrister, I think you need to read that. So my conditional acceptance was that I'll accept, you know, the whole system and everything that's going on. But here's my conditions, you know, you take it. I, I want to, I believe there's a trust set up. The whole thing, everything to do with law that I have learned over the years and it was accepted by the court, but she refused to read it. She handed it to there. So I sent a copy of that to the Attorney General. I sent a copy to all the relevant, you know, the Simon uh, Simon Colvin, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and I also sent it to the detective looking after the crime that was I was a victim in. And I invited the, the guards to come to the Tord court case. And I also invited some people to come and look and witness what I was doing. I didn't ask anybody for anything. I just said, look, this is what I'm doing. Do you want to come and see? You know, we were getting we were getting very respected in the court, you know, and sixteen people came as as witnesses. 
and I called them my grand jury on the day. There was doctors, there was different level of people, some great people, and we went into the court and we argued for an hour. And everything I said was, you know, taken up. The guard stood there beside me, a, a man called Michael D from Wexford Garda Station. And he was taking my paperwork and bringing it to the judge. And, you know, it was very respectful. There was about eight sergeants in the court that day. And, um, you know, everything that I was said was acknowledged in the court. But I, I'd said in there in when I've done the writings that everything is going to be done through the trust now. I'm the beneficiary. Anything, any paper, you know, I, I sent over to the Treasury looking for forms, the 1099As and the CODs and all that type of forms to fill out the, the way they do their transactions. And I discovered it all. And then I, for the third case, the, the barrister wanted me to give uh, another affidavit, you know, that was, they were trying to get a stall. So she made a direction in the second case, the second part of the case it was up three times that I would directed me to make a statement. So I respected the direction. You know, a direction in a court isn't an order. It's just I direct you to go left. You might want to go right if you want. That's a choice. But And I wrote my uh, affidavit in. I sent it by UCC, commercial post. It's registered post to the court, to the barrister. And it was signed for downstairs in the court. While I was arguing in the court, the judge had said that she hadn't received it. And I hadn't put in an affidavit and I had another copy of it in my hand. So she agreed to read it. And she read it out in the court and it showed all the components of law and the constitution and the canopy of law in era is on Bon Rock and the 63 articles. And we evoked Article 52 to Article 63 and presumed to 52 and all of those articles. And we re evoked the whole Irish law. And she read out then, she read out my statements and I obviously referenced the 80, the 84 page documents that the only deal I'll do is presumed to that document. But she refused to read my signature on the bottom and she said it wasn't signed, but it was still there on the bottom. And the reason she done that was, I know it was shown that the whole team because the signature read something, I don't have it here in front of me, but it reads as you say, colon, Rory, hyphen, Brian, colon, family of Adamson, beneficiary and secured party to the Social Security Zeste Kiwi Trust, all caps, Rory Adamson, without prejudice. That's what it read on the bottom. And that's what she didn't read out in the court. So then it came to a stage that I had completely separated myself inside the court from the whole trust and from the all caps name and the actual mortgagee that I was beneficiary she became the administrator and I switched the bank over to being the debtor. So then I stood up and I said, point out the person, because that's the person who owes the said money or loan. And the barrister on record stood up and said, on record, I'm putting personage on Rory Bryan. So he was putting that. That was like a crime of bondage. So I said, Judge Gardashi Connor members of the public, I want to report the crime. And she said to me, you can report the crime after the case. And I said, you've just acknowledged the crime. And the guard looked and yeah. So he stood with me and the case went on. Then she said, even though, she said, I have to allow this man to speak. So that was their barrister. Um, he was offered to take his cloak off, the black cloak he wears by the judge in the case. Mm -hmm. but he, he refused to do so so he had to then she wasn't going to commit the crime so he did a bondage or whatever it was so he, he stood up and he read out his scripts that he had I've never seen anybody read anything like it sweating, dripping so at the end then she ordered she made an order for possessed possession so it's an order for me and them to do business so now we're in the process of I'm right to them and they're right to me of how we're going to Resolve that if they get paid X amount, I want compensation of X amount. And that's the negotiations that are going on. As me, as not that all caps debtor anymore, I'm the beneficiary of the company. Here's the business. Here's the, here's, the, here's, the, here's what happened to me. Here's what I want compensation. And you could take whatever from that so-called Zestic EV trust that everybody believes is there. And I do too. So... The big thing about the guard, he, he walked us out of the court and he protected us and, you know, he was very good. 
and he came out and he took a few notes and recorded the, the crime. But like that, he changed then as well when he found Can me. Up. Ask you, what was the record? What was specifically? What was the recorded crime? As he that yeah, in his words, he said that I accused the Crown establishment. So inside the court, you have a Crown establishment, right? In every court, I suppose, definitely in the south of the island, all the courts, bar one or two, have a sovereign seal over the over the judge, and that's era. That's a capacity of national. That's what they're set up in. But then you have tenants, which is the crown establishment, and they run all the courts, all the administration, all the fines and statutes and acts and legislation. It's all run through the courts, are all run through the crown establishment. So every fine. Sorry. When you res- when you when you refer to the crown establishment, then who are you referring to? Well, it's the UK crown. They run the maritime law. They okay. run all the courts where you're getting fined or taxes or whatever it may be, um, even even putting people in prison. It's all done through bonds and stuff, but the whole courts are set up by the Crown and that's your all caps name. So I separated myself from that in the court. So the only way that he could connect me to was to bond me back to being, to say I am that Crown. So I separated. So that was the crime because no contract can be can be agreed upon without consent, and I wasn't consenting to be that person. So that was the crime of bondage, the crime of bondage, because I separated myself from right back to, you know, you talk about people claiming their birth certificate. Oh, I get you now. I get you. I can see it now. I was I was trying to figure it out. My I can see what the crime like. I they're trying to bond you to something you were not. Yes. Okay. But, the guards, um, like that, he he even said, you are you are accusing. He, he found me up to give me the pulse number. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I said, right, okay. I suppose now I'll issue you with a full statement. And he was there witnessing the court and he was very helpful or amical, whatever the word is, amical on the day. But when he rang me up, he, he refused to even listen to me speak. And he said, you are accusing the crown establishment of putting personage and bondage on you. And I said, I'm not accusing them. I said, I proved it in a court. You were there as witness that they did it. And he goes, well, I have a pulse number here now. And he said, that's going to be logged. And that's, and I said, look, this is being recorded. He said, I hope it is because this is the best I can do is give you a pulse number. You know, they're really, even when I done, I was hand. I handed that eighty-four page document to the man who was investigating the crime against me with the Carisford acid. So I sent him the eighty-four page document, and he phoned me to say that I'd given him too much information. He didn't want the whole banking, you know, institutions and the fraud. He only wanted to stick with the little bit of the case. I, I'm giving him too much, and that I would be taken off. Uh, I suppose his investigation I would be removed from being part of it if I didn't shorten my statements but the big thing for me Jerry is they don't want you to be a national because as a national no statutes acts and this is why we're talking about for people you're talking about legislation you're talking about hate crimes and all these legislations don't apply to an Irish national so they don't want you in that capacity because the court systems are not set up for it so they can't deal with me as such. Hence why they're trying to bond me back into being that person again. So just that quickly, um, John, it does make well, it does make sense, but it raises a, a number of questions. Um, so the other side of it is they don't want average people knowing what you've just outlined there. You know, they, they don't want them to get access to the information, if you like, for want of a better way uh, of describing it. Um, because a lot of what you've said there today now to most to people like me, I, I never even, you know, knew that was a way you could approach the courts or even knew, um, you know, some of the stuff about the 1937 uh, um constitution and stuff that isn't you know stuff that isn't in the the um, later versions of it um we have this idea of 
I suppose, let me phrase it this way. What's your view on how people view the Irish Constitution or how they should be educated on it? Yeah, that's a very, very good question because it's massive at the moment. It really is. Um, Constitution right now is the most important subject that people should be looking at because everywhere you go, you see political parties especially, you know, talking about constitutional change. Um, and they've already amended the Constitution since the First Amendment in 1939, up to 39 times now. And not one of them amendments has really been in our favour or for the benefit of the people. So to understand that the Constitution is massive because this is what's happened, constitutional change, people need to look at what a Constitution is, what it's about, how it relates to you as that man or woman how it gives you a right to contract or not to contract, and how they try to remove the nation. In um, I suppose the last big thing they did was 1998, the Good Friday Agreement, and they sort of amended or changed Article 2 and 3. But they've never taken away Article 1, and I believe that's what they're trying to do now. Okay. Um, Just a quick pause there, because... Um trying to kind of frame a simple way of speaking about all this stuff because it's highly complicated and it's obvious you spent eons of time going into the detail of it and um but in a sense is it when i when when i'm an irish national i'm asking the irish republic to deal with me as a member of the nation of era kind of thing like yeah. i'm air is my nation mm -hmm. you're the you know, this is the Irish Republic here. Good luck to you. But uh, I'm a, a free person of era. Is that is that kind of, uh, you know, fill in <laughs> fill in my gaps there? <laughs> yeah. Well, I wouldn't say I would certainly wouldn't say personal. Look, like you're 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 a man born into a territory, or mm -hmm. a woman born into a territory. Okay. And the state, the name of the state is era. Um, and you have a right to live without causing injury or harm or suffering, I suppose, is the famous cliche to any other man or woman. Mm -hmm. And then you have to say to yourself, right, okay, now how am I going to navigate my way through life? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, commerce is set up the way it is. You know, you have to go into a shop, you have to do commerce, you have to go on an airplane, you have to do commerce. So you have the right to contract or not to contract then. So if there is laws written in Clough Gaelic and there's a constitution and a rule of law for Irish nationals to live under and if anyone reads those articles and what the whole state is set up under, fair enough but when it comes to rules and legislations and statutes and acts and guidelines and all that stuff they don't apply to Irish nationals and getting back to your thing about what people's understanding of the constitution, I suppose it's, it is only the blue book you know, and you've seen the big case, I suppose, recently was Gemma Authority and, and John, Walters. John Walters' case. And they went into the court using the incorporated version of the Constitution. And, you know, you're going into a company as, as a business and you're not going to win with it. Because even through all the years, I've noticed the people who are using legislation, and some really, really well, great people, especially lay litigation in Ireland, those ones going into courts and getting results against the bank, let's say, and getting a, some sort of a ruling based on a clause in the legislation. They'd appeal that, and then in between that, the government can change the legislation just to suit. So it's all, all the legislation is just set up to suit the system. So the Blue Book Constitution that everybody is looking at and everybody understands as what they call the colour of law rules, off law, government off Ireland, none of it applies in, in Clough Gaelic Irish law in your constitution. So it gives you a capacity for, like me to travel from point A to point B across the territory, any part of the island freely, and I do so. I refuse to pay toll bridges and I refuse to, you know, do certain things that people do just because that's what I believe in. Um, you know, and I travel whatever automobile instead of a vehicle and I separate myself. But for me, it's not for people to do all those things, but it's certainly something 
that people should look at and understand what this constitution is about and why are they trying to remove it and have done from people for many years and it is a solution for I would say for most of the people that are the so-called awake or not awake or whatever and are worried about education and rights and property rights and all the stuff that are going to be removed through what they're looking for constitutional change that are going to be removed and if we don't protect this constitution we could lose it all forever that's my belief so it is um so it is um in terms of people's education it's it's the education is worth it from the point of view is that you have a set of tools at your disposal to protect yourself from the tyranny of the Irish state. Yeah, yeah. As I said, if something, like if they write to me or you or anybody with, um, I suppose, a summons or a, whatever, a court order or whatever it may be, well, you could argue, well, as pursuant to, to Article eight mm-hmm. or ten or whatever, fifteen point four especially. You know, and it's not in you can ask for it in Gaelic first and foremost, which none of their statute and acts do. But if it's not repugnant to the, if it is repugnant to the constitution, it doesn't apply to you. So you can you know, if something that's gonna benefit you, do it. And if it doesn't, don't that's the way I do it. But the mm-hmm. constitution can be definitely it's set out as rights, fundamental rights. In Article 1, we have inalienable, indefeasible rights. Mm-hmm. And it determines that. And it can be used as a tool of definite. It's not, how would I say it? It's not their solution, but it's certainly mm-hmm. as a solution to, to help people. And I don't know if it's the whole, for me, talking to people about the Constitution, is oh, that's De Valera's Constitution. You know, you hear this stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't care who wrote look, it. Or I, yeah, I look, I know there's... I know there's um, I know there's different perspectives on it, but I, you know, I won't say I don't. I don't know. I just, I just know from being out in groups and that kind of stuff. There's different groups looking at stuff like this. But there's one area I want you to talk about because we've been going an hour and a half and it's flown by, and I, I don't want this right. to end before I ask you a, a, a kind of a simple outline. Really, is how did you take your name from the process of taking your name from Rory Adamson to Rory Bryan. Good question. Good question. Yeah, I suppose looking around at everybody doing, you know, claiming their live life claim and all that. I done that. I created my own one. I didn't, you know, I went to a meeting with the famous Society of Peace, and they were claiming something different than I was. You know, they were talking about dry, uh, traveling in your private capacity, and I do that anyway. And he was talking about using the Bible, and I said, well, I just use my national identity and my passport. You know, your right to travel and. And that, and people talk about claiming and making a claim. You know, what I did, I suppose, is I went to, back to the birth certificate and looked at it. Looked at when I was born, when I was registered about nine or ten days later, and what was registered, and then my born name being Rory Bryan. And then I requested a copy of my mother's maternity records. And that was the name that I was given and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And I, I, I claimed that name as my Christ name, as my national identity. And that's who I am, and it's just a name. Even that isn't me, but it's a name. I, you know, and you talk about identifying yourself. I have a right to identify myself as who I know I am. I am Rory Bryan, the company that they was created through the birth certificate or corporation was Rory Adamson. If like you, you're at home now. I'm at home now. That's who I am, sitting in this capacity. If you it's decide, up to, it's up to the state to prove you're not that person, then. Do you know what I mean? And they can't. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, they can't. Yeah, well, how can they? Because, I mean, they can say, right, well, there's a driving license with a picture of you and you're all cops. And I say, well, yeah, but that's a driving license. It's not me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a simple thing. If you're going to drive and do commerce, if you're going to go to work tomorrow, Jerry, or if a doctor is sitting at home and he's sitting here as I'm Rory Bryan, now tomorrow I want to go to work and be a doctor. I have to then navigate my way into that capacity as that corporate name and serve my purpose in it and be able to step back out of it. So it's navigating your way through life. So how, how do you navigate travel then outside of the country? Well, the only way you can is step into your citizenship. There is no other way that I know of. 
You have no choice but to, to turn over the page from your national identity. If you open up your passport, you'll see the 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 Clough Gaelic writings, and then your right to, as a as a citizen, Irish citizen, not an Irish citizen of Ireland. And then it'll give you there's a it's like a seal out of New Grange, and under that there's a number that's your national identity. Then you turn over to your citizenship. So the only way you can fly through a port or a, or, a, or, a, or a boat is to go into a portal. You're going into citizenship. There is no other way but to step into that. It's the only way you can be a doctor, the only way you can be a taxi driver, the only way you can do any form of commerce is to step into that act as being a corporation. There is no other way. So there is a duality there in terms of living yes. your life. Yes. Um, and there's no point in saying there isn't. Like, you know, you have there at the moment anyway, in terms of, you know, there are certain points, but it's a choice of yours. I suppose you have the understanding that every engagement you make, whether it's a mobile phone company taking out a contract, whether it's a passport, is that you're you're taking on a corporate identity in to enter into a contract with a, another corporate identity. It's the only way business can be done because a man can't do a real contract with a man. It has to be a company and that's the way it's set up that way. So to realize that that exists is, you know, obviously, yes, it does exist. Now, how can I use that to my benefit and how when I'm not that, I'm in my private capacity, I'm in my national capacity. And when I do commerce, I step into my citizenship and that's the that's what they call maritime law rules and regulations, licenses, personas, personage. It's all there. Look up the words and meanings of it. Irish national capacity is, would you call it a free man? Nobody's free to do whatever they want. I can't go down the road and cause injury or break into someone's house or break a law of law. But legislation and statutes and acts don't apply if I'm going for a walk with my dog or I'm doing something with my family. None of it applies. If they write to me, and it doesn't suit me. I don't accept it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I suppose I just bring it bring it into the last question or two. Um, Rory is, um, what's the function? What's the goals of Unbunrocked? Because I know there's a group of you. You're very you're highly active. You're fi you're highly um, motivated. What's what's what are your goals or what are you hoping to achieve through what you're doing? Yeah, for me, you know, one of the greatest people I've met through all this was a fellow called Stefan. He was a, he worked for the British government. He was a nuclear scientist, but he was also a language expert. And he asked me this question as well, you know. And I suppose at this stage, we knew there was treaties coming. There was new systems going to be set up. And you can see it all happening now, pre-war, pre-reset, all happening, treaties and rules. So to get this constitution acknowledged by the people or to the negotiate table of the highest level of government to protect Irish people. That'd be my goal, that Irish people can say, hang on for a minute. This is a re this is a tool we can use against you. Um, just to move forward for myself on a personal level, um, while I was in custody that time for the driving offence, as they said, and I signed myself back out, I was staying in a property here because the guards had rang me and told me that, you know, there is a repossession order and stuff. So I, so I took it upon myself to stay in a council estate here in a council house in Bray. I had keys for it and stuff. But while I was in custody, I reported a burglary on the premises, the house. And they removed a lot of my stuff from it. And I was arrested for burglary and, seen, and since been charged with trespass and stuff. So for me... I'm that confident in this that I'm now going to go into court and fight criminal charges using the Constitution. And Are I you suppose saying that, sorry to interrupt you. Are you saying that they're charging you with burglary for going back into your own house? Well, no, it wasn't my house. I was staying there. Um, oh, right. Yeah, and I was in there six weeks. Um, the council knew I was there, but seemingly when I was in custody, the council reported a burglary on the property. All right, okay. Um, you know, while I was in custody, did that, and then I was subsequently arrested and brought in front of a judge. And you know, I I tried to argue my points then, and they said, "Look, you can you can challenge the jurisdiction. All we want to do is give you bail." 
And again, I argued for my signature and they allowed me signed there. So I have to reappear in February. So to understand the Constitution as a way of a tool of fighting the system that a group of people or other people would just have a look at it and understand that it's something that we can bring to someone at a level of, you know, the guy spoke in the group about Sinead O'Connor, someone big, someone with an influence that would come and look at us or someone in a ministerial. I, lo- I love what Matty McGrath spoke about last week. Maddie- and stuff. Someone to Maddie- come to us. Yeah, I think he mightn't be a. Um, from what I've heard about Matt, he's what he's fucking wide awake. Um, yeah, yeah. He might be bad, he mightn't be a bad guy to approach uh, approach on something like this in a privately first anyway. Yeah, but I suppose our ultimate goal is to challenge what's going on in our state era. Mm-hmm. What the world, you know, the the who and the the, the, the all their agenda. That Sinn Féin and, and Fianna Fáil and all of them are pushing through. You know, you can see what's happening with the migration and stuff they're bringing in and the plans for mining the mountains and stuff and all that sort of things is going on massively behind the scenes that we get into court. And the big, big thing for us is a judicial review based on the Constitution. And uh, mm-hmm. that, that's our ultimate goal, Jerry. That's where we want to be with this, you know, really and truly. And the people just to... Take the time out to understand the constitution before they either make opinions or have opinions or put it whatever down to try and understand what pro Gaelic is, what it means to understand the script and writings, and how important it is to save our national identity. Mm-hmm. And, and I think to, to me, and I, I say this wholeheartedly, I believe that this is a solution to do that for all anybody out there. Mm-hmm. So, what's the best way to get in touch with your group, um, Royal Brown? And are, are you looking for people to join? Join well, what you're doing. It's not about Rock? joining. It was. It's not even about joining. If people want to come on, you know, it's on Bone Rock chat, and um, you know, we're hoping to do something. I have a little bit of a day on the 29th because this needs to be celebrated. It's the 85th mm-hmm. anniversary of this constitution that I have here, not mm-hmm. not the blue book. Um, and if people want to get copies of that, is there a pl- where would be the best place to get a copy of that version of it? Um, that's a that's a good question. It's very hard to get. It's impossible. It was only found by by mouse last year. You know, Ralph has gone around talking about it, and it's enrolled in Supreme Court for years without having it. And um, we have a guy now going to print some of them and make them for us at a, at I suppose a cost. And maybe we get a website or we get them out to people or whatever. There is a PDF on our face or our telegram page but there's era says no to mine and if we can get a free pdf of it people can read it and Absolutely. look at it but if you do get that let me know because i think people will be interested in it yeah yeah if people want to see it it's a free available none of this costs money by the way sorry none none of it costs money only research no, and it, and, you yeah, know yeah yeah no i, I but even yeah yeah, but yeah, exactly. But even if it did, I think people would be willing to pay uh, the price as well because it's it, it's valuable document. Um, well, if it could be printed, it would have to be paid for because it is yeah, a valuable yeah. document. Yeah, absolutely, and it's 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 what makes us Irish. It's what's it's our national okay. text and it's our national constitution, and it I talks about we, rights yeah. for everything. Sorry, go on. No, sorry. I, I just had one final question, and it's kind of off topic, but it's it's this. Um, do you think, you know, you're talking about relationships with the Crown and kind of the, within the court system there and that kind of thing. Do you think there's a done deal between, in the background, bet, uh, between the UK and Ireland re, uh, Republic on a handover of the six counties? I Yeah, I well, is it a done deal? The only way they can do it is by nationwide referendum. Which yeah. is the full nation, like the like the plebiscite. Yeah, yeah. It's the only way they can really change the constitution. I would say the deal is done in the sense on their side of it. Yeah. Like you look at the Good Friday Agreement. I think it's going back to then. And in thirty years, there will be Irish unity, and you see Bertie O'Hearn and all the cronies popping their heads around. Mm-hmm. So what's happening, in my opinion, is you look at the treaty and the ninety-nine year lease, which is in Article Eleven of the actual treaty. I have an original copy of it here if anyone wants to question that. So Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, I believe, are part of the UK still. 
there were dominions, but the UK has left Europe and did so a couple of years ago. And you see how long it took for us to form a government and you blame the protocol. We came back into the Republic then. But what's happening in the in the in this in the background is Sinn Fein are now the leading party in what they call Northern Ireland, the fictitious state. And they're look they're obviously going to be the biggest party here in the south of the island. So this is the long term plan that they would then get the people on the full island to vote for this new Ireland unity, which is Ireland all caps. And what we're going to be voting against is this. Mm -hmm. So if people want to know what they're going to be voting for, I would say Sinn Féin will get in in the south of the island in 2024. And then they look like they're going to push for this Ireland unity by 2028, if not before it. So they're going to come up with some new form of constitution. So that's what they're going to be voting on is this. And you this is the thing that people we need to be shown to people for. So as it's a done deal, it's a done deal that it seems like it's well sold to the public. It seems like this pride agenda and the, the migrants that are coming in, you know, you look at them selling the mining rights to Ulster, Leinster, Connacht, all around the islands. We need to look at that. And a lot of these migrants are coming in from mining countries. Are they being brought in for that? This constitution, oh. you know, we we were we're already <laughs> that's um that is the first um I've heard a lot of different theories on why they might come in and that's the first one I've I've not heard that one before but there's a, there's yeah. a, there's only a logic to it. Well, there is, and it, you know, it was it was it was our great friend, my great friend, Mouse, Mighty Mouse, I call him because the man's a genius, you know, and he's so much information that he blows people's minds when he speaks too much, probably. But I understand him, and he 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 come up with that. Uh, you know, thinking, and it is a theory because we've been following the mining issue and it's massive. The UK Crown Establishment, the UK Crown Corporation have sold mining rights of up to 25% of the whole of Ulster and 28% of the whole south of this island through, through corporations. And then you see migrants coming in from we don't have many qualified miners here. You, know, you see all these men coming in and you worry, you know, what? what is it all about? Have the whole thing been sold out? Probably it is worrying. Mm -hmm. If they do get away with this Ireland unity and a new corporation. But I believe that if we can establish our identity in a national capacity and evoke it into court and change the jurisdiction or fight it, enough people get behind it that it might put it into it. Or give us an option to, for especially, I don't know, people who want to live, you talk about people living off grid or living free or living, you know, outside that crazy system of where it's gone from the First Amendment to where it is now to where are we going to end up to, mm -hmm. to separate yourself from it. I think the Constitution is the way to do it. So to answer your question, is it a done deal? It's a worrying done deal. Yeah, that's really what I would said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they reincorporate us all into this all caps Ireland. Why is no one talking about the Republic? Why is no one talking about ERA, especially the Sinn Féin or any of these ones and our actual constitution? Very well, so. That is a big question for me. And I, well, I'll put a, a final question to you now. And this is a final, final one because someone put it to me because I'm Sinn Féin's behavior is absolutely bonkers to me over the last four or five years. Um, but one counter argument I heard, and I, I didn't get much weight to it, is that somebody said that they won't reveal themselves until they get into government. The forces behind them. Um, and while that doesn't seem to ring true to me, um, that doesn't ring true to me. Somebody offered that to me as a counter argument is that, like, I've no sense, personally speaking, this is only personal opinion, that Mary Lou or Louise O'Neill, I think is her name, are in control of what we know as the Republican movement. All arms of it. I don't know what you feel about that. No, no, not at all. Not at all. None of them are. They're they're just corporate um, slaves like most of them. And the Good Friday Agreement was the final signature, I suppose, um, which I suppose they, they would have been probably promised at the time. You know, mm -hmm. it's all being sold as a, it's all a game that they're playing behind the scenes. 
that yeah. Sinn Féin. Now remember the Sinn Féin that I speak about, that Sinn, that like the Irish Republican Brotherhood, mm-hmm. the Irish Volunteers, and all those ones that won the votes for the first ever doll that became Sinn Féin aren't mm-hmm. the same Sinn Féin that we have today. They yeah, only came with it. in the seventies. They're a political political party and any political parties that are registered now you talk about people or I see people now going around trying to create new political parties you're, you're, you're not like a, a political party now is going you're joining that company and you will follow that rules in town councils chamber of commerce city councils government level you go in and sign a note over and you have a set of rules so it's not going to work it's not going to help anybody so Sinn Féin being exposed to most of the awake people that are being exposed now to their followers yeah. with hope like especially all the older ones all they want is a, is a United Ireland so they're selling that United Ireland to them but it's not the United Ireland it's not Ireland yeah. it's not the Republic it's none of it it's like a United Corporation so will they they'll probably will expose themselves more to them who vote for them because they say well this is not what we thought we were voting for Mm-hmm. But do you want, well, the worrying thing is about rural Ireland, where that's going to be in, in in time for it. You know what I mean? This is where that's under attack. So yeah, look, it, it's very worrying what Sinn Fein, um, and and I, I, I'll say the same about the National Party. My God, shame on that man who's who's he's talking about constitution and waving the blue book. Never mentioned era. You know the 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 Irish Freedom Party. They don't mention era. It's worrying that even those ones, for me, don't understand the constitution or talk about the, the nation. And do you think it's that it's that simple? They just don't understand it. They don't have. They've never got down in the weeds of what they're talking about. Or do you think it's something more sinister? Well, talking to a couple of the guys off um, the Freedom Party and the ones on the ground last week that I spoke to, I'd say definitely they don't understand it. Herman Kelly, I'm unsure of. Um, the National Party, looking at him, I think he does totally understand it. Um, I think it's just another maybe political wing of Sinn Féin that are trying to, the same language, you know, Constitution, De Valera is a bad man, ties the woman to the sink. The Constitution does nothing of the sort if people want to read the family and the, and the rights of a woman. They either go to work or not go to work but not have the necessity to, that if a woman wants to stay at home, be with her family, she should be provided for. It's all in the constitution. So it's worrying that there's, you know, for me, not talking about it at least. So I have a bit more hope for the Freedom Party, but again, they're a registered corporation to apply for a job in a, in a company that is registered and they all have to follow those rules and none of them are going to give any 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 hope to air it, none at all. The only way we can do this is by the people first and foremost getting to know it and then hopefully we can get enough people to form our own government, our own form of government as a nation. Mm-hmm. You know, not ruled by, We sp- you, I briefly spoke to you about Europe and people have this belief that Europe, especially the followers of the political parties, Europe's a good thing. If we can remove ourselves and gain responsibility for ourselves with a, with, a, with a Irish government for Irish people run by Irish people and Dal Aaron back out of Leinster House which is a corporation building that was only built for the Free State 1922 and it's not our doll and all that sort of stuff is, is the battle with, with them all so maybe people need to be asking political parties especially the ones that are anti-government these yeah. questions you know Listen, Brian, Rory. Sorry, we've um, we might leave it at that. But I might say to you, is I yeah. might get you back on again on specific issues that I might think to get your take on how uh, someone or some p- people might look at it from um, a constitutional rights perspective as to some of the yeah. things, some of the ways you've dealt with um, things that have cropped up in your life with the um, the, the Constitution. Um, I just want to take the opportunity to thank you very much. It's been a fast, one of the most fascinating interviews I've had, I've done. I've learned so much. And um, I just want to say my sympathy as to what happened to your mother and also, um, you know, the, all that um, you went through at that time. Um, 
just to anyone watching us, there's been a load of reactions as this has been going up here. Um, a lot of people watching in on it, so um, delighted to see that. Um, anyone follow me? Just follow me on or like or share this video on um, YouTube. The YouTube channel is The Scholar Gypsies. Or follow my work on the West Awake, which is westawake.substack.com. Um, so I'm just going to end the broadcast now. And just once again, thanks, um, Rory Bryant. Thanks.